to sell on the open market in the timely expectation of a competitive return. That's what commercial is um, in the United States. That's what commercial is. At, at best, at, at best, one might describe what is being called commercial space today as a private-public partnership, where both private and public equities are in play and private and public funding are in play. The huge balance today is the public funding. So today's commercial space uh, group, uh, those contractors may be the people who take us to Mars. I spent most of my life in government. I hold no brief for or against any particular contractor, those contractors may take us to Mars, but it won't be because there's a timely expectation of a return on the open market, because there's no business case that returns money from Mars in a timely fashion at a competitive risk-adjusted rate of return. No investor will do that. I will do better with my money in the S&P 500, and I can prove it to you. I do actually have an MBA. It's not a tough proof. So, how will we reach Mars? We will do so when it is the logical and reasonable next step in a national program founded on what U.S. human beings, the public, believe are national interests that they can support. We'll reach Mars when we're a space-bearing nation, committed to the frontier for the benefits it will one day bring in the belief that such benefits do in fact exist. We need as a society to believe that being on the space frontier, second to none, will bring benefits to future generations of human beings, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, about whom we care. When we're willing to invest in the enterprise because we believe being a space-faring nation on the frontier matters. When that matters to us as a society, it will happen. This view is one that requires U.S. society to, once again, be frankly and aggressively expansionist, forward-looking, possibly what one might call imperialistic. We would need to believe that the United States must be, needs to be, deserves to be first on the frontier because space is the frontier of our time and for many future times. We would need to believe that it is important for our society to be second to no one in exploring, exploiting, opening that frontier. This is more, in my opinion, more a matter of societal self-concept than it is of explicit policy programs and budgets. It is reminiscent of the behavior of Great Britain in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries up, say, up to World War I, when they lost too many millions of, of young, aggressive men to ever be a, a factor in the world again. What would be the key attribute of such a nation, a space-faring nation? That attribute would involve the commitment to go whenever, wherever, and as far of the technology of any given time would take them. The technology of our time today, if we put it back together, would take us to the moon. We can easily envision, with just a little bit more effort, that the technology of our time would take us to Mars. The technology of our time, of, of, of some future time, will inevitably settle the solar system with human beings. The question is what languages they will speak, what cultures they will share, you know, what, what morals and values they will propagate. Uh, it should be our view that, that those values should be, values and views should be Western values and views. That should be our purpose. But it will happen whether it is our purpose or not. The technology of our time does not allow us yet to envision settling the solar system. The technology of our time allows us to envision going to and settling Mars if we wish to do that. The commitment I'm talking about, the view that I'm talking about, is a strategic rather than a tactical view of what the purposes and values of society are. They are exactly opposite to the singular programmatic commitment of a tactical nature, even 
JFK's hallowed commitment to the moon, uh, you know, less, less well noticed, Nixon's decision to build the space shuttle for whatever set of, of political and tactical reasons, Reagan's decision to build the ISS, or even Obama's uh, decision to sponsor the asteroid retrieval mission. Each and every one of these is a singular tactical programmatic commitment. None of them is, a, what is or was a strategic commitment to being a space nation. The style and scope and the resources and, and even the performance allocated to these various programs that I mentioned differ. Uh, their, their political motivations differ. But in the end, their philosophy is identical. It is a tactical commitment to a particular program. It is not a strategic commitment to a national lifestyle. The analogy in, in uh, military terms might be thought of as uh, the United States will take a decision to build an aircraft carrier, one aircraft carrier, and we'll send that aircraft carrier to, uh, I'll make it up, the Mideast to intervene in a particular situation without any view as to the value of aircraft carriers at large in projecting American power and influence where the next generation might wish it to be projected for whatever reasons we cannot today envision. The Navy and the, the maintenance of the Navy by the United States for now two and a half centuries um, is a strategic commitment, a strategic commitment whose capability and whose tactics vary with the technology of the time, but, but those tactical decisions and tactical commitments have nothing to do with the overall strategic commitment of the United States since it was an infant nation to be able to project its power and influence and culture and values across the high seas. That's the difference I'm talking about. Now, in that context, would a spacefaring nation ignore the moon? I think you're going to realize that my answer is obviously not. Why not? I mean, after all, uh, President Obama himself said, I may not be quoted directly, but pretty close. We've, we've been there and done that. And many others have said the same. Um, I had the privilege a few, just a few years back of, of testifying jointly with uh, Neil Armstrong um, in response to the Augustine Committee's recommendations, which were, by the way, not as, as they were said to be. Um, and in that in that session, Neil pointed out that this been there and done that rationale was specious. And, and Neil particularly said, per that logic, after Lewis and Clark's uh, trip to the West Coast, we would not have bothered to go again. Uh, I love that, and I've used it a number of times since. <laughs> Wish I'd been the one to think of it. But in that, in that basket, you could, I mean, why? By that logic, Spain, after Columbus's first four voyages to the New World, and that's all that Columbus did was four voyages, Spain would have abandoned the New World instead of leaving it as the place where, you know, if you take North and South America together, way more people speak Spanish than English. Um, by that logic, uh, after the British Admiralty sent James Cook to the South Seas to observe the transit of Venus, and along the way, he, oh, by the way, discovered Australia between 1769 and 1772, they wouldn't have bothered to go again. I mean, Australia's already been discovered, right? Who needs to go back? The logic just doesn't hold if, if one compares, if one takes the moon out of the equation and says we've been there and done that. If you substitute any other human destination that there has ever been and leave the same verbs in place, the logic doesn't work. So why does the logic work for the moon? We've been there and done that, so we don't need to go back. Why does that work for the moon and it didn't work for any other human destination that there has ever been? I mean, Antarctica is the toughest place we've been so far, and we've now had a, a thriving colony in Antarctica for nearly five, well, for five decades. So I just don't think that logic works. Um, the question of the utility of the moon and how much commitment of resources we wish to 
make to avail ourselves of that utility? That's an interesting question, uh, one which relies for its conclusion on way too many facts, not yet in evidence, in order for the final answer to be known. Uh, the final answer may be that the moon is a very useful planetary body. It may be that it's not very useful. We can't know now, in, in, my, then in my view. So then, if a spacefaring nation would not ignore the moon, what would we gain if our next step, if our next step were the moon in a decade instead of Mars in a decade? And by the moon, I mean a permanent base on the moon in an enterprise led by the United States. Led by, not solely accomplished by. Well, geopolitically, it would matter because I, 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 I hate to depart from engineering uh, because it's my go-to strength, but I must. It is a fact, it is an observable fact that for reasons many of us who are engineers cannot fathom, that in the geopolitical world, the, the, the stature, the power, the influence, the cachet here on Earth uh, that accrues to a nation involved in the leadership of grand enterprises it simply is a fact. Okay? The United States lived for decades uh, because of its leadership in World War II and its leadership in getting to the moon first. Uh, our stature as a world power was profoundly influenced by those events. Uh, Russia bled horribly, losing 20 million people, uh, and was embroiled in World War II for six decades, and, and arguably was as or more influential than the United States in defeating Nazi Germany. Um, but the, the uh, public leadership of the U.S. among nations at the time that we did it allowed us to emerge from uh, as world leaders after World War II. We lost 500,000 people. The rest of the world lost 50 million in World War II. Plus. Leadership of grand ventures matters. Establishing a base on the moon would be a grand venture in the eyes of all we saw. The national security implications of <coughs> returning to the moon in the style that I have advocated matter. We would and should do it with allies and partners. That activity would bind those allies and partners to us and would mitigate the effect of such alliances with others. The European Space Agency, just recently at, the, uh, at, at Farnborough, uh, announced new levels of cooperation with China. I, I utterly fail to see how any policymaker in the United States can believe that it is in our best interest to create an environment in which it is preferable for, you, for the European Space Agency to partner with China than the United States. I don't get it. Um, for other national security reasons, into which I will not go at this point, uh, I believe that cislunar space must take on the status of an American lake uh, for, for purely uh, strategic military reasons, the United States needs to control, needs to be able to control cislunar space. That's the space out. The economics of returning to the moon, I think, are, um, mis are, are underestimated. There is an incalculable value to an economy in learning how to do hard things. And putting a colony on the moon would be a hard thing. Everybody elsewhere in the world wants to do deals with the countries that it perceives to be in the lead. Again, we prospered for decades with that after Apollo. <coughs> the economics of extraterrestrial resource utilization uh, will be important in the human expansion into the solar system. I believe the moon is the most convenient source of extraterrestrial resources that we are likely to find. With all due respect to those who, who uh, wish to examine asteroids for extraterrestrial extra resources, I, I applaud that. 
But I think in the end, the economics of the matter will say that the moon is, is the most convenient source. If we want to develop a truly commercial space industry, then with a core government mission to open the moon, the space transportation industry, the cargo market that that opens up, is enormous and continuing. It provides a business case which could sustain several space transportation companies um, rather than the not even one that the space trans the uh, uh, International Space Station crew in the cargo market can sustain. After the core commercial capability of reliable space transportation, then power, mining, construction, other space infrastructure will follow with a US government commitment to open the moon. The moon itself may offer commercial opportunities. We don't know yet. To say that it will not uh, strikes me as the same sort of uh, intellectual uh, uh, short-sightedness. I can't call it arrogance because it wasn't intentionally arrogant, but the same sort of intellectual short-sightedness which um, caused possibly our smartest president, President Jefferson, in his letters to his letter to Meriwether Lewis, chartering the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, Jefferson stressed the importance of Lewis and Clark finding a water route to the Pacific um, for the benefit of the fur trade. Read the letter. It's in Undaunted Courage uh, in the back. Um, when you see Jefferson's stress on enabling the fur trade, and this was one of our most far-seeing presidents ever, one of the most far-seeing world leaders ever, and the stress that he placed on enabling a water route for the fur trade boggles the modern mind. It, it's an indication of how little we can see about what generations which follow us will do with the resources uh, and in the places that, that they will command that we do not today. So the moon may provide its own economic values. How does all this help us get to Mars? Well, first of all, uh, long duration experience in deep space operations only three days from home cannot but be valuable. Is it necessary to reach Mars? I opened my talk by saying that. Nah. If just as an engineer you want Mars in a decade or so, well, you know, I think I know how to do that. I think we as a community, I don't mean personally, I think we as a community know how to do that. Um, but the experience will still be valuable. More importantly, the creation of a new societal norm, that one of the things the United States does is send people to other planets and they live there. One of, we need that as a societal norm. A societal norm for the United States must become that we are a spacefaring nation or we will not be going to Mars, in my opinion. I believe that may be the most important uh, feature of a commitment to return to the moon. I believe subsidiarily that it will also drive key technologies. I have opined on many occasions that the key technology for getting to Mars is being able to store cryogenic hydrogen reliably for long periods of time. Because whether you're talking nuclear or chemical propulsion, aerobraking or not, manufacturing propellants on Mars or not, no matter what, uh, being able to contain and store liquid hydrogen reliably for long periods of time is a critical, possibly the critical technology. Uh, Settling the moon, putting a colony, putting a base on the moon, will, in very short order, require the development of first nuclear electric power, space nuclear electric power, and then, I hope, space nuclear propulsion, both electric and nuclear thermal. These technologies, uh, again, possibly not absolutely essential for Mars, but very critical. Environmental control and life support systems. We need to do that for months at a time. We're learning how to do it on space station. Uh, the moon will enable that further. I'll go down to mining, manufacturing, construction. All those things are going to be important for Mars 
who will begin to learn how to do them on the moon. Finally, the comment was made, Scott talked about the landers for Mars not being that comparable to the lander on the moon. I'm going to disagree just slightly. If one talked about developing a lander for the moon that was a single stage device, down and up, where it were refueled in lunar orbit with, say, drop tanks, then the delta V required of that lander is just about the same as the delta V required for Mars ascent. So if one talked about a Mars landing vehicle being a two-stage vehicle, descent and then ascent, the ascent stage could be quite substantially equivalent to a single-stage lander on the moon. One needs an aerodynamic fairing, but other than that, very little else. So I do believe that there, there is absolutely substantial technology transfer. My bottom line, returning to the moon in the context of an overall strategic decision that we will be a space-faring nation and we'll go to Mars is the easiest path when the larger societal picture is considered. So in conclusion, if you want to go to Mars, embrace the moon. Thank you.
hoop that's taking this cavalier attitude. Maybe I'll give them a ride home. Maybe I won't. Let's say you're an asset administrator again. You get confirmed word that he's not going to provide that ride home. What's your recommendation to the president? Well, if, if I were still in a position of power, uh, as, as you will recall, in practically every testimony that I gave, I, I decried what I viewed as the unseemliness of having the United States depend upon any other nation for transportation to space. Um, I used to get routinely beat up by the OMB for offering such testimony, but I, I did it every time I testified. So it's widely known that, I, I believe it to be widely known, that I believe the United States should partner with other nations in space from a position of leadership, that those potential partners should not just include our good friends, but we should reach out to potential adversaries for such partnership, but that we should never be dependent on any other nation for anything of a strategic nature. That is my belief. We Americans are good.
gestation to be delayed in, in its, its assembly complete phase because we did the Hubble mission. I, I did that. It wasn't a freebie. It wasn't a, it wasn't a free for nothing decision. It was an obvious choice to me to take a station orbiter out of play for a couple of years and go fix Hubble. <laughs> such a minor decision, it, there was nothing, there was nothing to that. Whether it was or wasn't, we thank you. My question is this, uh, you, you talked about national commitment in the sense of, of the, the broad public. Yes. And it seems to me that we didn't have that when we became the leader in aviation or computers, but it happened no, anyway. That's what leaders are for. Leaders, we, we, okay. owe, we owe our stature in aviation, although he is far from my favorite president, we owe our stature in aviation to Franklin Roosevelt, who, you know, sponsored the airmail contracts, uh, you know, led, you know, he was a fairly far-seeing president in terms of developing the infrastructure of air traffic control and air traffic management that, that enabled aviation. So then, That's what what, let's just see if, if we're talking the same language here. Uh, by national commitment, you mean that there is a certain segment of the public that is fired with the idea, and there are leaders that persuade the rest of the public that it's okay to let them go do that? Not quite. Um, by national strategic views uh, and commitments, what, what I mean is that the way the universe, the way the universe is constructed some things are important and some things are not very important. And a reading of history will tell you that no society or nation survives and prospers if it fails to be on the frontier of its time. I can go back to Persians if you want. Uh, I, so I'll, I'll assert that as something which a reading of history will observe. It's about, I have a history degree and I agree. Okay, so it's about what makes human beings human beings. Now, could there be some other kind of human being with different DNA that's not us, that doesn't have that imperative? Sure, but those are theoretical human beings. We are actual human beings. This is the way we function. Okay, so it is important for, for national and global leaders to understand this and to say the human society will not prosper unless we are on the frontier of our time and space is that frontier. They need to articulate that vision to the, the society which they purport to lead instead of saying, oh, what, what does the poll say about where the people want to go so that I can say I support it? It works in the other direction. Um, Gallup poll, every Gallup poll done shows that uh, approximately, in round numbers, 70% of the people, American people, support a strong space program. And then, you know, the arguments then ensue, well, how strong do you support it? I mean, would you give up this to put more money in that for the space program? That's a stupid discussion. People, the normal human being does not do space for a living. We do, I do space for a living. The normal human being does not do space for a living. It is unreasonable to expect such a person to do anything more than to say, basically, I support you, or basically, I'm against you. That's it. They leave it to the professionals. Just as I am not a medical doctor, you know, if, if I draw a high PSA uh, on my next physical, I'm going to go to see a urologist. I don't, I don't specialize in, in, you know, male prostate cancer. We, we go to professionals for things that we need done if we believe them to be important. Okay? Otherwise, normal human beings live their lives. They get on with their lives doing what it is that they are professionals at. So if a Gallup poll says in round numbers 70% of the people support a strong space program, it's never going to get any better than that. They're not going to get out in the streets demanding that the president, you know, take us to the moon or Mars. I think they're telling me I have a couple more minutes, so I'm afraid. Do you, do you see the thrust of what I'm talking about, what leadership means? Leadership means making the obvious decision to fix Hubble even if other people don't think it's obvious. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, I'm curious, where is the money hiding that NASA has had at times more than during the Apollo era that doesn't show up on all the graphs like Dr. Hubbard's 
What is the graph? It shows up on on the sky. Just make a different slide. Yeah, it's a different. You just just take Dr. Hubbard's graph and add up the money in in the Apollo peak, and then add up the money between 1993 to 2007, and the latter one will be the bigger number. Okay, so you're talking that it's arithmetic because the, because that Apollo peak is a smaller number of years. Correct. Okay, thanks. All right. I, I, that did, if we're going to stay on schedule, that needed to be the last one. That's the final word. I, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm real sorry that we can't do more questions, but it was good. Thank you.